okay uh, let's continue from where we left so this is chapter 7 so uh, to summarize in the last class we uh, finally ended up with the uh, bandpass filter which uh, looked like this we had a resistor which was switched and connected to the capacitor and the output of the capacitor was again uh, multiplied by the signal p of t and uh, this is phi 1 and this is p of t right and we saw that if the clock were had a duty cycle of d that is if both phi 1 and p of t has a duty cycle of uh, d then the dc gain was what dc gain was d and uh, the effective bandwidth was d by rc right and it made sense because the resistor here is not connected throughout the entire clock period we are connecting it only for a fraction of the clock period so the capacitor uh, has only that fraction of time to charge or discharge so the time constant sort of look like a larger time constant and uh, so they look at the frequency response so it has multiple pass bands so we'll have one around dc one around uh, fs one around 3 fs and so on right and uh, this one point i want to clarify so uh, last class i we, the way we derived the bandwidth was we made sure that the voltage uh, across the capacitor at the end of every clock cycle that we try to match it to an equivalent r right and uh, the sampling of the capacitor voltage is happening by this switch that's fine but uh, so what happens if the rc time constant is very small is this so let us say if the rc time constant becomes very very small right so what might happen is so this will have a very wide band let's say now the second band that will also have a very wide band like this right so then those two bands will sort of uh, you know interfere with each other then the bandwidth the compute will not be exact so that is the limit okay so as long as we ensure that the rc time constant is much greater than the clock period we have Uh, the equivalent bandwidth we calculated will be fine okay and as rc value reduces uh, the approximation will become lesser and less valid right because the moment you increase the bandwidth of oops what happened so yeah the moment will we decrease the rc time constant the bandwidth of each subband keeps increasing and they once they start to interfere the our calculation will not be valid okay right and uh, towards the end we also looked at uh, the uh, we analyzed both lti and ltv systems so let's just quickly summarize them so we started by looking at the impulse response and how we can uh, compute the response to any arbitrary input based on the impulse response and uh, that gives the convolution integral which is basically y of t is integral uh, 0 to infinity h of tau x of t minus tau d tau this is for the lti case and for the ltv case what was this h of t comma tau x of t minus tau d tau right and let me again uh, clarify the notation so the time t here that is what is this time that's the time at which we are observing the output right so this is the observation time and say t not and this tau is the difference between the observation time and the time at which we apply the inputs clear so next we uh, looked at the response of the systems to complex exponentials and uh, let's let me call that as y e of t 
and let's say i apply an uh, exponential e power j 2 pi f t for the lti system the output is simply a scaled version of this and the scaling factor is simply a function of the frequency right and uh, how is h of j 2 pi f defined it is the fourier transform of the impulse response and that's basically integral h of tau e power minus j 2 pi f tau theta fine so similarly for the ltv case the response to the exponential was the same if you apply uh, e power j 2 pi ft at the input so here we'll have h of j 2 pi f comma t that's all right and uh, again this h of j 2 pi f comma t is the fourier transform of the impulse response fine and then we also looked at the conjugate symmetry that exists in the uh, h of j 2 pi f and in both cases we saw that h conjugate of minus j 2 pi f the same as h of j 2 pi f the same holds good here also And uh, finally, we also saw how we can estimate h of j to pi f, and how do we find it? We have, yeah, so we apply in a complex exponential e power j to pi f t, find the response. So basically, that's y e of t by e power j to pi f t, right? And uh, of course, e power j to pi f t means we have to apply both cos and sine. For the LTA case, we can do uh, get away with only one measurement because sine and cos are basically time shifted versions. But for the LTV case, we have to do two measurements. Great. So now let's uh, move to uh, LPTV case because the circuits that we have been dealing with, they're not uh, simply linear time varying systems, but linear periodically time varying. Right? So let me quickly write. So again, uh, let's start with the impulse response. I mean, we'll do the same exercise we did, right? So first we'll find what is the response to uh, arbitrary input, then complex exponential, and then see the uh, symmetry that exists in the transfer functions. So let's start with the impulse response. So say I apply an impulse at t equal to zero, I'll have some impulse response. And for a time varying system, if I change the time instant at which I'm applying the impulse, we'll get a completely, we can get a completely different impulse response, right? But uh, what's the uh, speciality about LPDV system? Yeah, so basically if this is, let us say I call this as TX. So for an LTV system, if you change the time instant at which you apply the impulse, the response you get can be completely different. But for uh, LPTV systems, say uh, I apply an impulse after a period TS, that TS is the time period with which the system varies periodically, right? So let me say LPTV at TS, which is one over FS. So then now if I apply an impulse here, I'll have the same thing which I got when I had applied the impulse at t equal to zero. I'll have something like this. And similarly, if I apply the impulse at uh, tx plus tx, ts, so this is the impulse. So I'll have the same thing, okay? So now uh, for the LTV case, we define the impulse response as h of t comma tau. And here, what is the time instance at which, time instant at which the impulse is applied? T minus tau, right? Remember, this is the observation time. This is the uh, time difference between the time at which you are observing and the time at which you have applied the impulse. So this is basically T minus tau. And the output is observed at T, fine? So uh, now for an LPTV system, we just saw that 
if the impulse is applied t s seconds later and we observe the output t s seconds later the response is same right so what i write it in words so if the impulse is applied so basically these two will be equal impulse is applied at t minus tau plus t s and output at t plus t s right it's basically the same right so i apply an impulse here at t equal to 0 and say i observe the output at some time instance t now if i shift the impulse and apply it at a time instant t s and observe the response at t s plus t both are same that's what i've written here is that clear so how will i uh, write this h of No, uh, remember the first argument is the time at which I'm observing the impulse, t plus t s, right? I'm observing at t plus t s, comma, the second argument is the difference between the tau two time instance, which is tau, right? Fine, okay. So the LPTV system, for an LPTV system, we see that the impulse response h of t comma tau is periodic in t right and uh, the period is t s okay great so yeah so now the lptv case we saw that uh, for an ltv case the impulse response was uh, varying with time Right, so you can think of the LPTV LTV as a special case of LPTV when T S tends to infinity, right? And of course, LTI was in uh, did uh, can think of it as a special case of LTV where the impulse response didn't vary with time. Okay, so just like how uh, we looked at the properties of LTI, and then we looked at what happens for the LTV case. Now we'll do the same thing. We know how the system, how uh, you know the properties are for the LTV system. We'll try to derive for the LPTV case. So tau is basically what the time difference, right? So this is the tau here. I mean, see the notations here are slightly different, right? I mean, the way I have written is this should have been tau, okay. Okay, I mean, if you think about it, this is what, in the first case, it's T minus tau. This is T, right? I mean, okay, the uh, what I have written and what I have drawn here, they don't exactly reflect each other, okay? Fine? Great. So again, let's start with the first. Let's try to find the response to an arbitrary input X of T. And we have already done that for the LTV case. So let's use that result. So we know that y of t is integral zero to infinity, h of t comma tau, x of t minus tau d tau, right? And uh, this is for the LTV case. For the LPTV, we know that h of t comma tau is h of t plus t s comma tau, right? Because we saw that the impulse response was periodic in t with the time period t s, right? So uh, so that's the only difference here, right? So h of t is now a periodic signal, that's all. So now with this information, can you comment on y of t and y of t plus t s? Same, different, Slightly different. Okay, I mean, you look at here, right? So, y of t, if I try to find the uh, output at, say, t plus t s, I'll have here t plus t s, t plus t s, right? I mean, of course, I know this is same as h of t comma tau, but we don't know about this, right? So, the point to notice. The impulse response might be periodic in time, 
but the response of the system need not be periodic. Okay, so I'll write it as not equal to, but this need not be. Right. Exactly, yeah, that's all. Okay, so now uh, let's proceed. So uh, we know that the impulse response is a periodic signal. So the moment we have a periodic signal, what do you do? Fourier series, right? I mean, like you have a hammer, you see a nail, what do you do? You go and hit it, right? Same thing. So we'll try to expand it using Fourier series. And uh, so first let's try to find the Fourier coefficients. So I'll call the coefficients as some hk. And what is that? How will I find the Fourier series coefficient? So 1 by Ts, I integrate over the time period, the actual signal, which is h of t comma tau, t power minus j 2 pi, oops, k times fst dt. Fine. And of course, if I do the integral, what will be the uh, coefficient HKBF fine? Huh? Sorry, there is no F. This is FS. The frequency information is contained in K, and that is captured here. It will be a function of tau, right? I mean, here you have three variables: T, tau, and K. T is getting integrated, so that goes off, and this will be a function of tau, right? And now I know the Fourier coefficient, I can expand h of t comma tau. So this is basically summation over k and k will go from minus infinity to plus infinity. The Fourier coefficient, which is hk of tau t power plus j by k plus t, right? So now I know uh, what is h of t comma tau, that is this. So I can uh, substitute this here, right? This is the response to any arbitrary input, right? And I found h of t comma tau in terms of its Fourier series coefficients. I'll simply go and substitute, that's all. So let me move to a second page. So y of t. This integral zero to infinity. I'll have h of t comma tau. So I have h of t comma tau here. And this I have expanded as the uh, Fourier coefficients. So let me write that. Summation over k, hk of tau, e power j, 2 pi k fst, fine. Uh, did I miss something? Fine, no? So this times x of t minus tau, t tau, right? So now I have uh, integral and uh, summation. What do you do? Yeah, I mean, you interchange without having a second thought just to piss off the mathematicians. So do this. So I'll take the summation outside. I'll have the integral first. So I'll just, uh, I mean, I'm integrating with respect to d tau. So first let me only write the terms containing d tau. So we'll have hk of tau and then x of t minus tau d tau. So this multiplied with t power j by k plus t, fine. So instead of summing up and then integrating and then integrating and then summing the quantities later, that's all. Great. So now you look at this expression and you tell me if it uh, rings a bell. Does it seem familiar to you? What is this? So this is basically the convolution integral for the LTI system case, right? So I can think of it as the signal X of T getting filtered by an LTI system yeah, with an impulse response. Uh, 
What is the impulse response? HK of T. Right? Clear? Yeah. So let us say if I were to model only uh, this portion. So how will I do it? I'll have the signal X of T. That is first getting filtered by an LTI system whose impulse response is HK of T. So that uh, gives this quantity. This is then multiplied with T e power J. Two pi KSST. Fine. So this is basically only uh, one part, right? Now I have to sum up, you know, for K and K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? So if I were to uh, draw the complete block diagram, so it will look like this. So again, we have to do from minus infinity to plus infinity, but let's say we truncate it to some minus N to plus N. So at the top, so let me write it like this, X of T. So this is the minus nth branch, let us say. So this is H minus N of T. And what does this multiply? N or minus N, right? E power minus J, 2 pi N F S T. And uh, similarly, we'll do everywhere here. And let's say this is the zeroth branch. So this is basically H zero of T. And what does it multiply? One, so just take it. And similarly, at the positive extreme, I'll have H N of T. And that multiplies T e power J two pi and FST, right? And all the outputs are then summed up. Okay. So this is for you, right? And the point to notice each of these filters, what kind of uh, systems are they? LTI systems, right? So everything here is an LTI system. So this overall uh, thing here, this models an equivalent LPTV system, which is periodic with a frequency FS, right? And uh, this kind of expansion is called uh, Zade expansion for LPTV system. Okay. Okay. Huh. Right. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it is still an LTA. Exactly. I mean, here you are multiplying with the periodic signal, right? This multiplication with the periodic signal introduces the periodicity. And that's all the system. I mean, that's how we have come to all the LPTV circuits we derived so far, right? Be it chopping or the bandpass filtering. Everywhere we multiplied uh, incoming signals with some periodic signal. Yeah, I mean, basically switching is, you can think of it as multiplication with uh, zeros or ones, right? So that's a periodic signal. Exactly. So, is that clear? Great. So this is the first part where uh, we look at the impulse response and the response to any arbitrary input. So what is the second thing we'll do? For LTA and LPTV, first we looked at impulse response. Second, we looked at the response to e power j 2 pi fp. So let's do the same. Again, we already have the result for the LTV system case. So let's start from that. So uh, the response to a complex exponential is simply h of j 2 pi f comma t times e power j 2 pi fp, right? And what is h of uh, j 2 pi f comma t? It's 
the Fourier transform of the impulse response that we have defined. So that's this H of P comma tau e power minus A two pi F tau D tau. Great. And here uh, we know that H of P comma tau it's a periodic signal. So this is equal to H of oh, this happens again. Yeah. yeah, so this is H of R T plus P S comma tau. Right? So uh, now what can you say about H of J two pi F comma T plus P S? It will be same as H of J two pi F comma T, right? Is that clear? I mean, it makes sense, right? The impulse response is uh, varying periodically with time. So even uh, the same will hold good for the frequency response, right? So what is H of J two pi F comma T? It is basically the uh, scaling factor. When you apply complex exponential, right? At t equal to zero, I mean, or like you apply e power j two pi f t, you will have this. Now, if I uh, shift the sinusoid and apply after t s seconds, I'll have the same. Okay. So great. Okay. okay. So let me push it up, maybe. Yeah. So again, now we have a periodic signal. So what do we do? Fourier series, right? I mean, same hammer, different nail. The result is the same. So okay, let me move to next page maybe. So I know H of J two pi F comma T. H of J two pi F comma T plus T S. So first let me find the Fourier coefficient. So let me say the coefficients are H K. And I'll find this using the same method, one by T S, integral over T S. This signal, which is H of J two pi F comma T, e power minus J two pi F T D T, right? So now here, what will be the uh, Fourier series coefficient uh, be a function of? So we have uh, three independent variables, right? F, T, and K. So when I integrate with respect to T. T goes off, so I have this as a function of k. So it is still a function of f. So this is I'll say h of h k of j two pi f. Fine. Right? So now I have found the Fourier coefficient. I can uh, expand the frequency response as summation over k. The Fourier coefficient h k of j two pi f. Fine. Times t e power j two pi k f s t. Okay. So now uh, we know what this term is. We have expanded as Fourier series. So we'll go back and uh, plug it here. That's all. Okay. So we go here. So y of t is basically the incoming complex exponential e power j two pi f t times h of j two pi f comma t, which is now expanded as the Fourier series. This h k of j two pi f times e power j two pi k f t. So this is the h of J two pi f comma t, fine. Great. So now I can uh, bring this e power j two pi f t inside. So what do I get? H k of j two pi f times, huh? Two pi f plus k f s, fine. Okay. So uh, remember, this is the response. Then let me dot here maybe. So this is the LPTA system. 
at fs. The input here is e power j two pi fp, right? And the output is this. So uh, at the input, I have applied a frequency f. So what frequency components I am getting at the output? F plus kfs, right? So that gives an f out at f plus kfs. And uh, this sort of explains what we were also seeing uh, you know, earlier with our circuits, right? So, and uh, what is the strength of uh, the tone at f plus kfs? hk of, this is scaled by hk of j 2 pi f, okay? So uh, this scaling factor is uh, called as the harmonic transfer function. Okay, because it basically tells the strength of the tone that is shifted around kth harmonic of the uh, periodic frequency, right? And uh, again, I want to emphasize this. So uh, for the harmonic transfer function, the, in the in input argument is the input frequency, right? And uh, the output frequency is this input frequency plus this uh, harmonic number k times fs, okay? So if I uh, write h2 of j2 pi f, so what are the input and the output frequencies? Input is the argument inside the term that is f, and the output frequency is f plus 2f. Okay. Right? So uh, the bottom line is that for an LPTV system, if you apply uh, an input at a frequency, say, f1, at the output, this frequency will get translated around even, I mean, uh, integer uh, multiples of fs, right? So I'll have one around f1, one around f1 plus fs, I'll have f1 plus 2fs, Similarly, I'll have on the other side also. Okay. And uh, what is the harmonic transfer function that relates the uh, input at F1 to the output at F1? H0 of J2 pi F1, clear? So this is H0 of J2 pi F1. What about this fellow? H1, right? So this is H1 of, I'll just say F1. And this is H2. And similarly, on the negative side, what is this? H minus 1, right? So this is H minus 1 of F1. And this translation is governed by the transfer function H minus 2 of F1. Okay. So now we got the rules of the game. So let's uh, see how much you understand. So let's say I uh, give a signal at F plus LFS at the input. At the output, I'll definitely have a tone at F, right? So what is the harmonic transfer function that governs this translation? Okay. One, let's say one is, someone is saying plus L, one is saying minus L. Okay, what about the term inside? See, uh, Recollect the term here. What is this? Yeah, yeah, what is F1? F1 is the frequency that is applied at the input, right? So, what should be the argument here? F plus LFS, right? So, let me write it as F plus LFS. So, it should be plus L or minus L uh, here? It should be minus L, right? So, So this basically is governed by the harmonic transfer function H minus L of J2 pi F plus LFS. Clear? 
state. I mean, the same uh, you can also work out from the uh, Zade expansion. Right, so here, let us say I gave an input frequency at F. Of course, after uh, filtering, I'll have F, right? Because these are LTA systems, the frequency is preserved. But the moment I multiply with the complex exponentials, here I'll have F minus NFS, and you'll have all the, you know, like uh, frequency components, okay? And uh, of course, here we have these, Filter set right? HK of T. Uh, do you think this HK of T, that is the impulse response for these individual filters, and the harmonic transfer function HK of F, do you think they are related or not related? I mean, from the Zade expansion, we saw that we have a bank of filters with an impulse response HK of T. From the complex exponential uh, case, we saw we had harmonic transfer functions hk of j to pi f. So, do you think uh, these are independent stuff or they are related? Yeah, I mean, of course, they have to be related, right? Because they govern the same LPTV system, they have to be related. And as you mentioned, uh, you can relate it using Fourier transform. You can work it out. Okay. Great. So, yeah. So now we have. Uh, then the second part where we found the response to complex exponentials. So third, let's uh, see what kind of uh, symmetry we have, right? For the LTA case, we saw H conjugate of minus J to pi F is basically H of J to pi F. For the LPTV case, H conjugate of minus J to pi F comma T is H of J to pi F comma T. So now for uh, the LPTV case, we have uh, another transfer function. And what is that? The harmonic transfer function, right? So I'll have HK of J to pi F. So let's say I write interested in this. H conjugate of, I mean, HK conjugate of minus J to pi F and H of J to pi F. HK of J to pi F. So uh, do you think there is a relation between these two? Hmm? Okay, why do you say they are equal? Correct. I mean, yeah, yeah. HK of T is real. But uh, this is not the see here. How did we get this? Is basically the Fourier transform of H of sorry H of T comma tau, right? Uh, whereas where is that? Yeah, this is basically the Fourier series coefficient of H of I mean, this, that's how we derived it, right? This is the Fourier series coefficient of H of J to pi F comma T, right? I mean, this quantity is real, but this need not be, okay? So, I mean, we can uh, check that also, right? So let's say H K of uh, J to pi F, I find it as the Fourier coefficient like this, right? So h of j to pi f comma t i'll have e power minus j to pi kfs t right so let's say ah yeah now let's say try to take the conjugate here h conjugate so this is also conjugate here this becomes plus. So now uh, if I try to put a minus sign here, I'll have a minus sign here, right? That's all. And uh, of course, I know uh, this portion, H conjugate of minus J to pi F comma T is same as H of J to pi F comma T, right? So 
15, yeah. So these two are equal. Okay. Fine. I mean, uh, what I told, I mean, initially we just took a conjugate and then I put a sign here. So now what I'm saying is, let me, till this point it's clear, right? I just took conjugate on either sides and changed F to minus F, right? And uh, here we saw that H conjugate of minus J two pi F is same as H of J two pi F. So this I'll replace it as basically H of J two pi F, that's all. Fine. So now how is uh, this related to this quantity? What is the difference? No, there is no F, right? F is only here. Here it's KFS. K is replaced by minus K. FS is not a variable, right? So the one, this is basically equal to H minus K of J2 by F. So the symmetry that exists here is H conjugate minus K of J2 by F is HK of J2 by F. Fine. So yeah, this is it. And uh, lastly, let's see how we can measure the harmonic transfer function. So uh, of course, uh, we can use two dif different definitions for it. HK of J2 pi F is basically the uh, transfer function that governs the frequency translation from what frequency to what frequency? F2, F plus KFS, right? So how do we, I mean, uh, what is one way in which I can measure HK of J2 pi F? Correct. Divided by? Yeah, so we have to apply basically uh, E power J 2 pi FT and find the, uh, you know, uh, find what we have here. F plus KFS times T, right? So uh, this scaling factor is basically this. And of course, other ways, uh, the definition was, I mean, the way we uh, actually did it was, this is basically the Fourier series coefficient of H of two pi F comma T. So you can find H of J two pi F comma T. And even for that, you will have to apply T power J two pi F T, find the uh, response I'll apply e power j 2 pi ft and find the response to it and divide it by e power j 2 pi ft. That will give me this quantity and then I can find the Fourier series coefficient. Right? Fine? Yeah, so uh, to summarize uh, for the LPTV case, when we had an arbitrary input x of t, we saw that that LPTV system Putting it out here. So the LPTV at FS, this is Y of T. We can model it as the input X of T getting filtered by a bank of LTI filters, right? Uh, whose outputs are multiplied by complex exponentials and uh, you can sum them up. Right, and uh, we saw that when we apply a complex exponential uh, e power j two pi f t, that is when the input frequency was f. At the output, we can have frequency components at f plus k f s, and uh, this frequency translation was governed by what we called as the harmonic transfer function, which is h k of j two pi f, and this itself was the Fourier series coefficient of H of J2 pi F comma T, fine. And uh, the symmetry that exists for the harmonic transfer function was H conjugate minus K of minus J2 pi F. Basically you uh, conjugate and you know, uh, have negative for everything, right? So, 
this is hk of j2 pi that's fine so so enough about this theory so let's now uh, look at some harmonic transfer functions for some basic systems so let's uh, yeah let's start with a simple case this is basically a mixer where my input x of t is say multiplied by sin uh, 2 pi fst and i'll have the output here so how do you suggest we find the harmonic transfer function hk of j2 pi f yeah how do you find that also we have to apply we will apply an exponential e power j2 pi ft so if i apply j e power j2 pi ft what do i get at the output huh yeah, yeah so what is y of t and this is basically y e of t so what is this i mean what is sine 1 by 2j e for j 2 pi fst right so now tell me what is uh, the output Yeah, one by two j e power j two pi f plus f s times t minus e power j two pi f minus s times t. So, I mean, from this, uh, can you tell me what the harmonic transfer functions are? Yeah, what what is one by two j? H one of j two pi f Right? I applied an input at f. I see that I have an output at f plus fs, and that seems to be scaled by 1 by 2j. And it's minus 1 of j 2 pi f, that is minus 1 by 2j. And all other uh, hks are 0. Hk for k not equal to plus or minus 1. Fine. Great. So now let's uh, find the harmonic transfer functions for our uh, bandpass filter, right? So let's let me draw the circuit input. I have the resistor and the switch and capacitor. Yeah, P of Fine. And by the way, uh, one thing. So for the bandpass filter, in the previous classes, when I was sketching the overall frequency response, so let, let me probably yeah, it's right here itself. So when it sketched the frequency response, we had something like this, right? How did I obtain this? How how was this uh, frequency response obtained? That is, what was the input and what was the output? Input also was at f, and output was also at f. That's how we computed, right? I apply an input at some particular frequency. Find what is the strength of the same frequency I get at the output. So what is the uh, transfer function that I'm actually plotting in terms of the harmonic transfer functions? Huh? In the input is at h zero of j two pi f, right? So basically, what I was plotting here was it's zero of j to pi f, right? I applied an input at f. I found what is the strength of the same tone at the output. Fine. Great. So yeah, so now let's uh, find hk of j to pi f for this. And let's start with a simple case. When I apply a DC, that is frequency of zero. So when I apply a one volt DC, I mean, f equal to zero, which is basically for j two pi zero t. That's basically one, right? Only real portion is there. So if I apply a one volt DC, what will be the signal I have at the capacitor output? One volt. It's an RC filter. Just that I'm, uh, I mean, uh, this will take a longer time to achieve the steady state because the switch is active for 
portion of the time. And I'll assume that uh, phi 1 and phi of t has a duty cycle of half. Okay. For simplicity. So I know that Vc of t is what? 1 volt. So what is the output? It will be a square wave that goes from 0 to 1. Right? So let me draw that here. This is my output y of t. That goes from 0 to 1. So can you tell me what is h 0 of j 2 pi 0? So first of all, what what is the what are the frequencies at the input and the output for this case? Input is at zero, DC. Yeah, first let's yeah, output is also a DC, right? I mean, this basically governs the translation from the input frequency, which is DC, to the output, which is also DC. Right? So I apply the input at DC and I found this is the response. So to find H0, what should I look at? I should look at the DC component at the output, which is half. And in the last class also we uh, found, right, this was half. So uh, now let's say I want to find H1 of J to pi zero. What uh, does this govern? I mean, what are the frequencies I'm interested in? Input is at zero, output is at FS, right? So this periodic square wave I can decompose as uh, DC component plus the sinusoid at 2 pi FST and what is the scaling factor? 2 by pi, okay. If the square wave was going from minus 1 to 1, it's 4 by pi. For 0 to 1, the range is half, so it's 2 by pi. Plus, of course, you have higher harmonics, right? So uh, let me write it. So I'll have 2 by pi sin 2 pi FST and uh, how can I uh, write it in terms of the exponentials? It's 1 by 2j times e power j 2 pi fst fine. So uh, what are the, I mean, from this, can you tell me the harmonic transfer functions? H1 of j 2 pi. 0. Input is 0, right? So this basically is the strength of the tone at Fs. So that is basically what? Uh, 1 by pi j, right? So if I write it in the standard form, it's minus j by pi. Similarly, it's minus 1 of j 2 pi 0 is plus j by pi. Okay. Great. And uh, what what can you say about H2 of J2 pi 0? 0. Right? This is basically the strength of the frequencies at 2FS. We don't have any component at 2FS because it's uh, square wave with 50% duty cycle. So this is 0. And similarly for minus 2 also 0. Right? So we'll have only H, I'll say 2K plus 1. The only the odd harmonics will be present, and the only exception is zero, right? Only H zero of F is non zero. Okay, great. So now let's uh, take another frequency. So let's say we are interested in F equal to Fs. So, how do you uh, start? What is the input I should apply? I have to apply E power J. 2 pi FST, right? So basically, which means I have to apply, I mean, E power J 2 pi FST is a complex signal, right? So what do I do in practice? I'll have to apply cos and sin, right? This is basically cos plus J sin. Okay. So this, the response I'll call Y of P, I'll write it as the response to the cos plus J times the response to sign, right? So I'll have to do two experiments here, right? And uh, I mean, finally we'll have a complex signal, so it might uh, become tricky. So we'll take the second approach to find the uh, 
harmonic transfer function, which is the Fourier series method, right? The harmonic transfer function was the Fourier series of h of j two pi f comma t, right? So here let's uh, let's try to find out h of j two pi f comma t, and that's basically how do I find it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the response to p e bar j two pi f t, which is basically y c of t. J y s of t, and then divide by by f t, right? So uh, I'll write it like this: e bar j two pi f t minus j two pi f t, right? So what is the real term here? I mean, if I expand this, what do I get? Y C of t cos two pi f t. What is the other real portion? Plus Y S of t sine of two pi f t. Fine. Plus let us uh, then the imaginary portion. So what is the term that multiplies cos minus Y S of t? Correct, right? Plus, sir. Huh? No minus, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Minus y c of t sine two pi f t. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll find uh, the response y c and y s. From that we can find h of j two pi f comma t using this fellow, and then we can try to find the Fourier series coefficient, right? I mean, in the DC case, it was simple because it was just a real signal, so it became trivial. Okay, so first let's find uh, what is the response to the cos signal. So let me draw the circuit once again. So I'll have the input here. Right, and R and C. Here it is cos of two pi FST. Right, I'm interested in F equal to FS. Okay, great. Uh, so this is let's say the time axis. So the cos will look like this. Right. So let's say this is t equal to zero, and this will be Ps. Right. Fine. Now uh, this switch is on for half the time. Okay. So what will happen every clock period? This portion of the sinusoid will be averaged by the RC filter. Fine. That is when the switch is on. The portion of the waveform that the filter sees is what I have highlighted in green. Right. So I'll assume that this portion is when phi one is on. Okay, is that fine? For half the time, uh, phi one is on, and uh, during that time, this portion of the waveform is what is seen by the RC filter, and the RC filter will try to average this waveform. Okay, and we'll assume that the RC time constant is much much larger than Ts. Right, so that at the output it has only very low frequency components. Okay, and when the switch is open, the capacitor will retain the average value as such. Yeah, in the steady state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only in steady state. I mean, if the RC is large, it will take a long time to reach steady state. But we are only interested in steady state, right? So, uh, so what what do you think the response will be now? It will be zero, right? Because as I mentioned, when the switch is on, the RC filter tries to average the input that it sees, and in each clock cycle, it sees the same waveform that I have drawn, right? One half of the cos waveform. And when the switch is off, it's going to retain that average value, and uh, the average value of this is zero. So Y C of t approximately zero. 
I mean, this is based on the assumption that my RC time constant is very large, that it mostly has only DC, and you can ignore all the other frequency components. Okay. So my YC of t is zero. Clear? Great. So now let's uh, do the sign. So uh, this minor changes, I'll have this is YS of t. This is sign. So the waveform which sees will be this portion. Mm -hmm. Right? So So this is the sign. So the portion of the waveform that the RC filter sees will be this. Right? So the RC will try to average this portion of the sinusoid. Right? And uh, so what is the, if I look at the, uh, oops, the capacitor voltage, what will be, what will that be approximately? It will be two by pi. Two by pi is the average of this portion of the waveform. Right? So this will be approximately two by pi. So uh, what is Ys of t? I mean, Ys of t is this fellow. I found that the capacitor voltage is almost constant and equal to two by pi. So that gets multiplied by P of t, fine. So how will uh, the final response Ys of t look like? No, no, you are looking only at the DC, right? I'm looking, I'm... See, this is DC of T, clear, right? DC of T is a constant approximately, and the constant is two by pi. That goes from zero to one. No, let's, uh, this is the waveform I'm asking. The waveform will be a square wave. Is that fine? So the waveform will look like this. No, no. Yeah, it will be, I mean, uh, finally, approximately in steady state, this will be average value of the uh, this portion of the waveform. So if you look at DC of heat, it might approximately look like this. I mean, what I'm assuming is the uh, RC time constant is very large. That assuming, I mean, that only DC term is present. All the other frequency components are attenuated. So what happens here? Let me expand it maybe. So the this RC is active, and when the RC filter is active, what is the waveform it sees? Only this portion, right? So I can say that, uh, I, I mean, to a first order, I can model this as I have a continuous RC where the input is this, right? Right? Because only one for the switches on for half the time. And whenever the switch is on, the uh, filter sees this portion. And when the switch is off, it's going to retain the value it had before, right? So to a first order, I can say that the response I have here and here will be same. That's fine. I mean, just that because we have uh, opening the switch, this will take a longer time to reach the steady state. That's the only difference, right? Is that okay? So this voltage will be approximately equal to the average value of uh, this waveform, which is two by pi. Clear? Any, any questions, anyone? Okay. So if, uh, if you are convinced that this voltage is a constant and equal to two by pi, so let me draw it here. This is two by pi, C of t. The output Ys of t is a square wave that goes from zero to 
2 by pi. So now we have both uh, yc and ys. So we can find h of j 2 pi ft. So let me do that. So this is the expression we had. Oops. Comment. And uh, yc of t was 0, right? So what I can do, and uh, I can remove the portions corresponding to yc of t, right? So we'll have uh, this as the final equation, fine? And this is h of j2 pi fs comma t, right? Because my input is fs. So this is also fs everywhere, okay? And uh, yeah, so let's plot uh, this real part and imaginary part, right? So real part is basically ys of t times sine 2 pi fs t and ys of t itself was a square wave. So I'll have to multiply this with a sine wave, right? So sine wave uh, will do something like this. Is that clear? So if I multiply these two, what do I get? I'll have only half wave, I mean, like a half wave rectified sine wave sort of thing, right? So why uh, this is the real part. We have something like this. You say this is zero, this will be TS and what will be the side? Two by pi, right? So this is two by pi. What about the imaginary portion? That's basically the same YS of T multiplied by cos. So we'll have half waveform of the cos, something like this. And then it goes to zero. Right, so. And again, the amplitude is two by pi, okay, fine, great. So uh, this is basically our H of J two pi FS comma T. So I can find all the harmonic transfer functions from this. So what is uh, H zero of J two pi FS? H zero is what? Is the DC coefficient of the signal. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, hold on. So let's, we have real and imaginary. Let's find the average for each. What is the average for the imaginary portion? Zero, right? This is going from uh, positive to negative, right? Imaginary portion goes off. So we need to focus only on the average portion of the real, uh, this real section. So what is it? Yeah, see, uh, I know that, probably I'll go here. So I just have this. The average is two by pi with an, I mean, if of course it's an amplitude one. So if I have this, what will be the average? One by pi. But now my amplitude is not one by pi, it is two by pi. So this is two by pi, right? So it'll have H zero of J two pi FS is two by pi squared, right? So uh, let's find one more value. Uh, what can what can we choose? So let's say I am interested in h minus one of j two pi fs. And uh, what are the input and output frequencies for this case? Input at fs, output at dc, right? So this says what is the strength of the tone at fs that uh, falls down to dc at the output, right? And how do I find H minus one? This is basically the minus one Fourier series coefficient of H of J two pi F comma T. So uh, let's quickly write what H of J two pi F comma T is. So this is the real portion of the, uh, this fellow, right? And uh, the real portion is basically sine for half the time. Right, and the imaginary portion is cos for half the time. Clear. So, uh, so this is basically two by pi sine two pi fst. That's a real portion plus j cos of two pi fst. 
the imaginary portion and this is only for 0 to ts by 2 and for the remaining half it is 0 right and of course i can simplify this right uh, in terms of exponential what is it i mean i want to write it in terms of an exponential complex exponential what will it be let's say take j out uh, if I take j out, I'll have cos 2 pi fst minus j sin 2 pi fst, which is e power minus j 2 pi fst, right? And this is for the remaining half. So now we have a closed form expression for h of j 2 pi f comma t. We can quickly find. So let's do it and end. So h minus 1 of j 2 pi fs. I mean, uh, this is fs comma t, right? f is f is for us. This is 1 by ts integral 0 to ts h of j 2 pi f s comma t times what is the exponential I have to multiply with e power. I am interested in minus 1th coefficient. It will be plus j 2 pi f s t dt. Right? And I know that uh, this fellow is non-zero only for half the time. So I can change the limit to zero to Ts by two. And what did I have? Two by pi j. Two by pi j e power minus j two pi fst times I'll have plus two pi fst dt. So what do I get? What is the integral? 1 by pi j. Right? So, what does it say if I give a tone at fs and observe what is the strength of the dc at the output? That will be 1 by pi j. Okay? So, uh, let's me summarize the values for f equal to 0. We saw h 0 of j 2 pi 0. So what? Input DC, output at DC. Huh? So input was at DC and output is at DC. What is the strength? Half, right? You give a DC, the RC filter had the same DC component that multiplies by one zero square wave. So this was half. And uh, H1 of J2 pi 0. So let me see. H1 of j2 pi 0 is minus j by pi. And H minus 1 of j2 pi 0 is plus j by pi. And for f equal to fs, we saw H0 of j2 pi fs was 2 by pi square. And uh, H minus 1 of j2 pi fs was also j by pi, right? So if I sketch the uh, the frequency response, that the frequency response, I say it has it's zero of j two pi f. So we'll have something, and at DC it is half. This is h zero of j two pi zero, and at fs, what is the strength? This is H0 of J2 pi Fs. H0 of J2 pi Fs. That is 2 by pi square. And similarly, you can find what happens if you apply for 3 Fs. Okay. So uh, this is the way in which you can sit and compute actually. And uh, to let me quickly summarize the procedure also. So if you want to find HK of J2 pi F, you have to apply a complex exponential at a frequency f and you can if you can uh, write the uh, final output as sum of these kind of exponentials the strength of this term directly gives hk of j2 pi f but if you're not able to do you'll have to find h of j2 pi f comma t and you can find it by applying a cos and a sign 
and divided by the uh, complex exponential and uh, we saw what was it we had a real portion and an imaginary portion and once you have h of j 2 pi f comma t you can find the fourier series coefficient and that gives us hk okay so yeah so uh, probably in uh, next class uh, we'll see